Welcome back to a domain driven journey. In the last video in this series, we started doing event storming for this sample domain, which is a judging system. This is the sample domain that we have chosen for the series, a judging system that would be used at a hackathon to judge the projects that are submitted to it. Now, during this event storming, we came up with a bunch of events that we want to work with. We have a good chunk of events now, and really we can keep on going. There's so much that we can explore here. For example, we can keep going further after the winners are decided and get more details of what exactly happens after we have decided on winners. How do we decide what prizes to give them? Where do these prizes come from? How do we purchase and ship it to them? How do we ask for their contact information? We can also go into more details about the project submission, about what happens at the hackathon on the day of, everything from the starting keynote to starting the hacking time to the workshops and the fun mini games that we do in between to all the announcements, all the support that we provide, all the resources to help a hacker or to help the participants submit their projects. We can even go further before these two and look at how we reach out to judges, how we ask them to sign up or what factors go into deciding the categories. There's a lot more details that we can fill into this. And we have seen in the last video how event storming can get really, really big and complex. Now you might be asking, how the hell do we deal with this sort of a complexity? Maybe you're struggling with this in your own projects. You have a lot of requirements, a lot of features to take care of, and the project is just getting crushed under the complexity of it all. Well, you'll be happy to know that bounded contexts are here to save the day. How do they do that? Well, easy. You take a bunch of events like that. You make a box around it. Let's make it transparent. You call this a bounded context and you're done. <laughs> oh, if only it were that easy. So the whole point of a bounded context is to help deal with these huge domains with large complexities and make no mistakes. Most domains that we work with, are complex enough to require multiple bounded contexts. Even something as simple as this hackathon judging system will have maybe three or four bounded contexts at the end. So bounded contexts need to be as self-contained as possible. You should be able to zoom into a bounded context, see all of its inner workings, uh, reason about it without having to think about other bounded contexts too much. You have to think about them a little bit, but not much. It should be as self-contained as possible. We should even be able to take one context and implement it in our software independently without thinking of other areas or other bounded contexts. There's a lot of different ways to achieve this, a lot of different tools that can help us figure out bounded contexts. And I'll talk about a few of those today. Let's get back to our domain here. Let's get rid of these. The biggest thing that we can use to discover bounded contexts is inconsistent definitions. A lot of domain-driven design is about the language, the definitions, the concepts, the terms that we define when trying to describe our domain, when trying to talk about the domain, so that everyone knows exactly what we are talking about when we make a sentence with these words. Since bounded contexts are self-contained, the language and the definitions of things should also be contained within that context. And they can be different from the definitions that are outside the context or in other contexts. Let's take an example of these categories. We decide a category here, then we assign a judge to a category, and then when projects are being submitted or when hackers are submitting their projects, they can select which categories they want to submit it to, and then they will be judged on each of those categories. We have our important terms from the last one, so let's try to add a category here. So a category is something we decide assign judges to, projects are submitted to, and judge for. Now this is a very simple vague definition of what a category is. The first thing that we can notice here is that it's a, it's a complex definition. There's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of things that we do with a category, which means there might be some things that we can separate out. However, before that, Let's talk about the general category, which is a category that we never decide. The general category is something that all the projects are by default submitted to. It's not something they have to opt in for, which means when you're submitting a project, you don't have an option where you see the general category. You only see the other categories like the best design hack or best data science or machine learning hack or best use of Google Cloud, whatever. You see those categories, you don't see general in there, but 
when we assign a judge to a category, one of the options is general. We do assign some of the judges to, or most of the judges to this general category, which all the projects are submitted to by default and they don't have to pick that category. So we have these two different definitions of categories with us right now. One that includes this general category and one that does not. This is the concept that we use when we are assigning judges to categories and when we are ranking projects or scoring projects. This is the category that we use when deciding and when submitting the projects. The general category is not an option there. To be more explicit about this separation, we can call these the opt-in categories and we can call these the judging categories. However, the main point is that we are seeing this inconsistency in the definition of what the word category means. The mistake to make here would be to have just one generic definition of the word category that serves all purposes throughout our application or throughout our system. We've all done that. I've done that before. I've built a judging system for this hackathon and this is exactly what I did. I just have one definition of category concept in there. And there are a lot of places where I am checking for if category equals general, then do this, else do something else. And this can often lead to unmaintainable code because we have these if statements flying everywhere. So what we know now is that we need at least two bounded contexts. One where the word category means this opt-in category and one where the word category means the judging categories that includes the general category. So let's start making these separations. We already talked about that we are not deciding on a general category, which means we are only deciding on the opt-in categories. But when we are assigning judges to it, we are assigning them to the general category. Let's move this a bit up. Now when projects are being submitted, they're only selecting the opt-in categories, not general, which means we can put this here. And for everything else, we want the general category there as well, since we are using it for judging. So we can move this up. We can put both of these into boxes like this. So this is one context and this is the other bounded context. In this context here, once again, the word category means the opt-in categories. And here, the word category means the judging categories or the categories that projects will be judged for. Now we have these two bounded contexts for now and once again, we can do a lot more things to figure out even more bounded contexts. But before we do any of that, I have to emphasize that all of this is guesswork. We are just guessing on what bounded contexts might be self-isolated or self-contained, which means we are almost never going to get this right immediately or on the first try, or maybe even the second, third, fourth try. It's very important that when you make a guess, you have to assume that you are wrong. If you operate on the assumptions that your guess is right, your brain will kind of start playing tricks on you and make you ignore any information that contradicts your assumption. And we've all been there, right? Right now, if I just declare this to be the correct bounded context, then we're kind of stuck with this. And every time we get new information, we are going to treat it as hostile, as something that is attacking our own beliefs, which we don't want to do. We want to be flexible, and open to new information that can change our assumptions because at the end of the day, we just made a guess and guesses can be wrong. Instead, if we just start out with the assumption that our guesses are wrong, then we'll constantly be looking for more and more information to figure out if we are actually right or not. I'm pretty sure this is not the best way to break up our judging domain into context, which means we can start to apply some other things. The first one that we did was inconsistent definitions. Now let's talk about occasions. Occasions are basically specific events that are special. They are more important than the other events for whatever reason. It's almost as if you can narrate a story where a bunch of different things, a bunch of different events build up to this one occasion. And then it happens, everyone's clapping and happy. And then a bunch of other people have to get to work and deal with the occasion. Let's talk about a quick example of, let's say an online business. What would some occasions look like? In online businesses, you might have occasions like someone clicks a link and comes to your shop or your product page, whatever. Marketing people are hard at work on making this one thing happen. And when it does happen, there's confetti everywhere, people are clapping, and now the sales team gets to work. Now it's their job into making sure you know everything about the product and why you should buy it. And you end up buying it maybe by entering an email address or your credit card details or whatever. That's the occasion that they're building up to. And once you do that, once you buy the product, once again, everyone's happy, everyone's clapping, and now 
the fulfillment team gets to work if it's let's say a physical product in that case now the fulfillment team's job is to get that product safely delivered to your hands once that's done that's an occasion for them once again everyone's clapping everyone's happy and now maybe the support team gets to work so now let's try to find some occasions in our hackathon domain first of all since it's a hackathon deciding the winners or having our hackathon winners is definitely a big occasion so let's make this slightly bigger to show that it's an occasion it's a special event it's something that we are all building up towards the project submitted is also an occasion because once again it's a hackathon that's the whole point that we have participants show up who work on a project and submit it to the hackathon so another thing that you might start noticing is that these occasions are special because they bring value to the overall organization or they contribute to the long term or the overall goal of all of this that's how you spot your occasions or your special events okay we might have a couple more that we can find a judge assigned to a category a judge signing up is probably not the biggest occasion but a judge signing up could be an important occasion and a judge being assigned to a category is potentially a lot more important because not only do we have to get judges we have to make sure that we have judges for all the categories so really the big occasion here is when a judge is not not only signed up but also assigned to a category this is the confetti moment for a hackathon this is what everyone's waiting for to make sure that we have judges for all the categories not just that they're signed up speaking of categories a category being decided is also kind of an occasion because a lot of things depend on it not only does the judging depend on it but also we need to figure out what prizes we need for categories you also need to announce these in our opening keynote or maybe in our social media whatever so this is also a big occasion it's very important to emphasize that all of this is guesswork and as we get more information we will probably change our minds on what is an occasion and what is just a regular boring old event now that we have these occasions or these special events by the way some people like to call them pivotal events but i think the word occasion feels a little better once we have these occasions you can kind of see how the smaller events are kind of building up to a big occasion for example here a judge is signed up and then they are assigned to a category here before the winners are decided a lot of these things have to be done we have to create judging groups each of the judges have to rank projects and score them and then we have our winners if you can create narratives like this where a lot of small events kind of build up to the occasion the pivotal event that's a pretty good sign that you've discovered a bounded context like that which means we can make another one here and we can potentially split this out as well into two separate bounded contexts now this is a very light rule of thumb which is that every bounded context should have one or two or just a very small number of occasions or pivotal events but as i've mentioned earlier this is all guesswork over time you'll keep acquiring more information you'll keep running into new things talking to more people and you should always be flexible with your context boundaries this is just what my new guess looks like of what the bounded context should be we went from 2 to 4 because we got new information we figured out what the occasions are and we modeled around them the only time you can be really confident that these boundaries are correct is when you have a lot of information like this that supports your justification or supports this assumption that these boundaries are correct and also everyone in the room all the domain experts that you're with they all agree to this this separation that's when you can be very confident about these but until then you have to keep looking for areas of improvement and it's not just taking existing contexts and splitting them up it's also possible that you'll run into information which will make you merge two contexts together let's look at our third strategy which is existing boundaries existing boundaries is usually a pretty good indicator of what bounded context should be what the boundary should be basically we have to try to figure out if there are different people or different groups of people who are domain experts in certain areas or who operate in certain areas they know all the rules about just specific certain areas for example once again the people who are deciding the categories might be the same people who end up operating the hackathon or the submission part of it if that's the case we can get rid of this and combine these two like that into the same bounded context and now we have three 
we might also have different people working at this judging step. Maybe the people who help the judges come up with ranks are going to be different from the people who end up calculating them and deciding the winners. And in that case, we might want to split up our contexts like these. I'm going to go with this separation here with the four contexts because those two examples don't really apply to the specific hackathon that I'm thinking of. But once again, your mileage may vary. For your specific domain, the context boundaries should to some extent align to the existing boundaries that are in your organization. So maybe different teams, different domain experts, different places, different rules, different definitions. These are all some ways to find out your bounded contexts. Bounded contexts is probably the most important concept in the entirety of domain-driven design, which is why it's pretty much impossible to cover in a single video. So throughout the series, we'll keep coming back to this idea of bounded contexts, how we separate them out and keep discovering better boundaries for our domain. So make sure you subscribe to this channel and you don't miss future videos because like I said, bounded contexts are pretty damn important. The best way to get value out of this series is to follow along. And if you are following along, make sure you're using this video's sponsor. Eraser is a diagrams and documentation hub for engineering teams. Since launching in March of 2021, hundreds of thousands of users have used Eraser to draw architecture diagrams, create technical planning documentation, conduct whiteboard interviews, and sketch wireframes. Eraser differentiates with developer targeted features like markdown notes, diagram as code, and keyboard first flowcharting. Like I mentioned in the last video, I've been using Eraser for pretty much everything over the last couple months, and I am really enjoying the experience. If you want to try out Eraser, go to tryeraser.com slash dev, and that'll let them know that I sent you there. Thanks Eraser for sponsoring this video, and I hope to see you in the next one.